If you want to build muscle size and strength, but you only have a pair of really light dumbbells to hand, then never fear, the Bioneer is here. The good news is that if you only have light dumbbells, there's still a ton you can do to build strength and performance. And in fact, there's a particular technique I've used with lightweights that I credit for 90% of my own physique and a lot of my own performance. This is something you can only do with lighter weights or your own body weight or resistance bands. And so I'm gonna talk about it now. And I think it's one of the most overlooked strategies for building muscle and improving overall performance. So go and find those turquoise dumbbells you bought when you were 13 and let's start building some muscle. Much better. So the main big strategy that I wanna talk about in this video is using partial range of motion or continuous time under tension. The intention here being to prevent yourself from locking out at the top or the bottom of the movement and thereby to ensure that you don't get any rest, you don't get any intraset rest. So between each repetition, there's no slight pause and there's no opportunity for your muscle to get more blood. What many people don't know is that their muscles actually work like little hearts, like pumps that help to move blood around the body. When you contract a bicep, you basically squeeze the blood out and then when you relax it, it sucks it back in. So when you perform lots and lots of repetitions without any break in between, no rest, without locking out the joint at all, this creates hypoxia. It reduces the amount of blood that gets to the muscle. And there are some interesting studies that now demonstrate that this is the case. This has a similar effect to blood flow restriction training, but without the need for straps. At the same time, this causes the buildup of metabolites, things like IGF-1 and growth hormone in the muscle, which may further stimulate and encourage hypertrophy. And because your body then responds to the lack of oxygen and blood supply in the muscle, it can even increase vascularization. Then you get a greater blood supply to the muscle. That means better strength endurance during regular training. It also means faster recovery post-training because your body can deliver more nutrients to the muscle. On top of all that, there's even studies now showing a correlation between vascularization of a muscle and myonuclei count. That is to say that your myonuclei increase when you increase the blood supply. This gives you a greater propensity for protein synthesis and muscle building. With greater blood supply to the muscle, more metabolic stress, more myonuclei, we could expect this to have quite a profound effect on muscle growth. And that's why I think a lot of bodybuilders intuitively use this kind of pump training to get that feeling of being extremely swole in the gym because that then translates to greater growth outside of it. And on top of all this, it can also increase the activation of fast twitch muscle fibers. The reason for this is that by inducing hypoxia, you cause the slow twitch muscle fiber to give up much quicker. So basically when you go to move a weight, you will engage motor units depending on how heavy that weight is and how quickly you want to use it. Your body will only recruit the smallest and slowest muscle units necessary to conserve energy. So normally if you're just picking up a spoon, that's gonna be your slow twitch muscle fibers. However, if you lift something very heavy or want to launch it really far, you'll engage your fast twitch muscle fibers. This is why we conventionally want heavy weights as well as to create muscle damage. However, when you use a lightweight but go to high, high repetitions without resting at all, then you can fatigue the slow twitch muscle fibers and now your body has no choice but to switch to the faster twitch muscle fibers. And when you create hypoxia in the muscle, according to studies, even through this kind of pump training, this happens quicker because your fast twitch muscle fibers don't need the same oxygen supply as your slow twitch muscle fibers. I'm gonna use push-ups as an example because that's what I do a lot of using this technique. However, you can apply this to other weights, to light weights, and I'm gonna show you how to do that as well. Basically, what I'm gonna show you is gonna go against everything you've been told about how to do a push-up, and when you watch me do it, it's gonna look, like I say, like I'm cheating. So normally, you are told to get into push-up position, and then to lower yourself nice and slowly. So forward with your sternum, then move upwards, protracting the scapula at the top there, and carry on. However, the way I'm gonna recommend doing the push-up is keeping your sternum and face about an inch or even more from the floor, exploding straight upwards so that you're almost doing a plyometric push-up. You'd almost launch up in the air and then literally just dropping back down and going again immediately. So the aim here is to get as many repetitions as you can, like so. And then the idea is to pump those out to failure and that's important because that's what's going to allow the fast twitch fiber to take over and give you that explosiveness and build more muscle more quickly. This is unfortunately one of the unintended consequences I see of YouTube in general, the homogenization of exercise. You see a few people perform an exercise in a certain way and telling you that this is the best way to do it and other ways aren't as effective. And so then everybody performs that exercise in that way. They're afraid to do anything different because they don't wanna be judged on Instagram or on YouTube or even just in the gym as doing it wrong. 
However, there are multiple different ways to perform the same exercise and they can provide different results. So locking out at the top of a push-up, for example, is really great for developing scapular control and, and slow eccentrics is great for creating hypertrophy through muscle tears and building strength and control and you know, your sticking points in the range of motion. However, going fast and explosively like this clearly has benefits as well. And of course, the exact same principle can be applied to bodyweight rows, to pull-ups, but also dumbbell curls with the light weight, also shoulder press, literally any movement that's safe to perform with high repetitions like this and a more explosive cadence. I wouldn't recommend doing something like an Olympic lift like this or a deadlift. However, squats are absolutely fine. Hindu squats are fine. Lunges are fine. You might think this sounds absurd, but if you just give it a go, I think a lot of people are gonna find that incorporating three sets of 100 push-ups at the end of their workouts, maybe three times a week, will create a lot of growth in the pecs, especially if it's not what you're used to. So yeah, just try it. There are so many anecdotal stories of people building massive muscle using just body weight, but I think that the secret source is that lack of lockout, the continuous time under tension. This is one of the ways I keep my physique looking kind of okay-ish for this channel, despite spending an awful lot of time doing things like mobility training and hand balancing. I just spend 15 to 20 minutes a few times a week pumping out these high repetition movements with a lightish weight and with continuous time under tension. And I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking that by not using full range of motion, you're not gonna be developing as much strength because you're not going all the way down to the bottom and the top. This might be true to a certain extent, but there's actually mixed evidence. It's not as clear cut as you think when it comes to the benefits of full range of motion and how that applies to different muscle groups. It seems that it actually varies from muscle group to muscle group and it seems to have a bigger effect in the legs in particular, but we just don't know how much range of motion contributes to strength. It seems to in some cases. When you hold an isometric contraction, just hold one position, you actually build strength 15 degrees above and below that joint angle. So if you're coming almost to the top, then chances are that you're going to be building a bit of strength above and a bit of strength below, and that might well be enough. And another thing to consider is that you don't necessarily need strength all the way through the range of motion, depending on what your goals are. When it comes to vertical jump, for instance, studies show that there isn't actually a huge advantage to squatting below parallel or to parallel because when you perform a vertical jump, you don't squat all the way down, touch your ass to the grass and then leap up in the air. You just do a small dip and then launch back up. So in the study, it was found that using dip style squats, which don't even go to parallel, could improve the vertical jump just as much. However, once again, I'm not saying that you do this instead of full range of motion. I'm saying you do this as a separate alternative approach. Full range of motion is fantastic for things like mobility. So don't stop doing that, just do this on top of it. A technique you can use to take this even further past failure is a mechanical drop set. I've talked about this a lot of times. But the idea is that you switch immediately from the movement you're doing to a slightly easier version of the movement. It's like lowering the weight so you can carry on going even when you're fatigued and that way you can exhaust even more fibers than would otherwise be possible. An example of this would be to do as many push-ups as you can then to stop and immediately start doing push-ups on your knees. Or for instance, you could do as many curls as you can and then immediately switch to doing hammer curls. And if you want to be really crazy, you can end with something called burns, which is where you only perform as much of the range of motion as you're now able to do. So you might perform you know, 20 curls, then you might do 10 hammer curls, and then you might switch immediately to doing just this with your arms to literally fatigue all of the muscle fibers. Don't recommend this until you're quite experienced because this really is taxing, but it does a whole lot for growth and for muscle endurance. And yeah, once again, I recommend you just try it before you knock it. It might not be for you, but it might work wonders. This is the bicep routine that I always use. Curls, hammer curls, sometimes cheat hammer curls while I'm swinging, and then burns at the end where I'm just doing that small amount of movement. For push-ups, of course, we'll just be pushing yourself a little bit, bouncing up and down just above the ground. And this works better with our purposes here than a drop set with weights because a drop set with weights requires you to stop training to go and get the weight and then to carry on. Whereas a mechanical drop set you can switch immediately with absolutely no pause in between. So an alternative version of this continuous tension approach which is to use very slow repetitions at a very slow cadence. And this is something that Pavel Satsulin recommends. This way, you don't engage the fast switch muscle fibers because you're not sending the right neural drive, not sending the right message to activate them. If the weight is too light and you use a large motor unit, you're gonna like launch it in the air. Your body doesn't have the option to use part of a motor unit. You either engage it and exert that power or you don't. So if you go slow, you simply won't engage those motor units. You'll just fail in a different way. And Pavel points out the importance of training the slow twitch fibers 
to failure because slow twitch fibers do contribute to your strength. You don't only use slow twitch or fast twitch fibers, you use a combination in any scenario. And of course your size as well because fast twitch fibers might be larger, but slow twitch fibers still contribute some size. It's really hard to fatigue the slow twitch fibers. So if you use really slow repetitions like three second eccentric and don't lock out the movement, keep under that tension, then you can train your slow twitch fibers in that way. And just moving really slowly through a range of motion with light weights means you change the strength curve. You're not cheating by creating momentum. You have to engage and control the movement all the way through, which can lead to more strength. And of course, light weights can come in very useful when training smaller muscles and isolating them or when using positions where you're at a mechanical disadvantage. Whether you're doing something like dumbbell face pulls, for example, you want a lighter weight for something like that or tricep kickbacks even. So yeah, when it comes to training with weights, bigger is not always better. I hope you found this video useful and interesting. Let me know in the comments down below what you use lighter weights for. If you found this useful, then please like it and share it around. That helps me out immensely, particularly sharing with friends or posting on forums, etc. There's a huge amount to boost the channel. I want to take a moment to thank you guys so much for your continued support, in particular lobbying to get me mentioned on channels like Greg Doucette's. I really appreciate it. He made a really nice video and I have you guys to thank for it. So, so yeah, I couldn't be more grateful. If you guys like this kind of training that looks at alternative approaches to building strength and performance, not just size, not just strength in the big lifts, but different interesting aspects of how you can use your body, then you might enjoy my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training, and there's a link to that in the description down below. I also have a print book, Functional Training and Beyond, which you can get from all good bookstores, including Amazon, and I'll put a link to that as well. That's a kind of introduction to the concept of functional training and why it's so valuable for athletes, but also everybody else. Either way, thank you again so much, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.